Bonjour à tous, bienvenue, ça fait plaisir de vous retrouver ici, on vous propose quelque chose de fantastique, voilà, on a un invité d'honneur, il, il est vraiment fabuleux, euh, vous allez pouvoir lui poser des questions, voilà, donc on a décidé de ne pas faire un keynote mais de faire quelque chose de très interactif avec les questions euh, voilà, qu'on va pouvoir poser à, à notre invité. Rappelez-vous en 1999, oui je sais, c'était le siècle d'avant, Amazon avait à peine commencé à vendre autre chose que des livres. Steve Jobs annonçait l'iMac en cinq couleurs. Voilà. Excite avait, Excite, vous vous rappelez d'Excite Ils avaient refusé d'acheter Google pour un milliard de dollars. Oui. Et le jeune Mark Zuckerberg avait 15 ans. <rire> C'est 99. C'est aussi l'année de la première édition d'un best-seller iconique en marketing, c'est Permission Marketing. Et notre invité d'honneur est à la fois euh, sur le hall, les Hall of Fame Marketing et Marketing Direct, c'est l'auteur de plus de 20 best-sellers, c'est l'inventeur de 2P du marketing, et oui, <rire> Permission et Purple Co. pour l'innovation. J'ai le grand plaisir avec Laura d'accueillir auprès de nous Seth Godin. Thank you Seth for being there. Thank you very much. Hello, Tess. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Peut-être pour commencer, euh, Laura, je vais te laisser poser la première question à Seth. Merci, BBC. Hello, Seth, and thank you for agreeing to be with us today. We're very honored to have you. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you for all the hard work you did in prepping for this. It's so much more engaging to show up and have a conversation than to just prattle on. So I'm <laughs> eager to have a conversation with folks. And sorry, I couldn't be there in person. I miss France a great deal. And we'll welcome you as soon as it is possible with all the sanitary conditions. Um, I have a first question for you. And people who follow me in, in, on LinkedIn know that this is a big, big pet peeve of mine. But today, the word marketing seems to mean only operational digital channels, which I don't agree with. But what is your definition of marketing? Well, first, I'll tell you that uh, peeves make terrible pets. So I try not to keep them around. Uh, in the US, what marketing has come to mean is all the stuff that annoys us, the hype and the hustle and the lies. I refuse to call that stuff marketing. And there's a, another group of people who think that what marketing is, is the algorithmic digital quest to buy attention really cheap pop-ups, pop-unders, tracking people, cookies, and it's turned into sort of a, a technocracy. That's not marketing either. For me, marketing is pretty simple. You make a promise and you keep it. You figure out who you're looking to make. And when we talk about people who are great marketers, what we're really talking about is someone who made something we wanted, someone who showed up and talked to us in a way that we were happy to be talked to. And all the other stuff is a sideshow. It begins with what are you making? Who are you making it for? And are you keeping your promises? Uh, my question, Steph, is the people in the, the audience generally knows about uh, minimum viable product, MVP. Uh, you also want marketers to focus on MVA, the minimum viable audience. Could you expand on that, please? Yeah, so this one is widely misunderstood and I think it's really important. It's one of the most important ideas I've shared in the last few years. And it goes like this. We have been persuaded by the TV industrial complex, by social media and by capitalism to make something for everyone, to watch out for criticism and to figure out how to go right down the middle for the masses. But that happened at the very same time that TV faded away and there is no mass. You can't buy the homepage of the internet. It is almost impossible to reach everyone these days. So, you know, when I think about my friend Apollonia Poulain, who runs uh, the best bakery in Paris on Rue de Cherche Midi, Poulain bread is not for everyone. In fact, it's almost for no one. And that's okay because there's enough no one in the world for it to be a thriving business. So, what we need to do is be on the hook by being specific. This is exactly for those people. You know, if they decided to make a Birkin bag that appealed to everyone, no one would buy it. The very reason that the Birkin bag is such a cash cow is because 
it's almost for no one. And it's not just luxury goods. It could be, you know, a tool for a factory. It could be a service that's offered to people who take care of the elderly. Be very specific, not just about the demographics, but about the psychographics, about what people believe. And if you put yourself on the hook, then it grows. But the fastest way to get big is to be small. Okay. So I'm guessing that a lot of the marketers that are listening to us today are going to be Rue du Cherche Midi tomorrow to buy their bread. So thank you for your friend. <laughs> and um, I have a question, and maybe that's just what you did, but do you have a great example of inbound marketing done right within the right strategy? Because we are at Inbound Marketing France. Right. So let's even begin with what is inbound marketing to begin with, right? So I think we can understand that outbound marketing is how do I hustle for people's attention to get them to notice me? Whereas inbound marketing is how do I do the hard work of earning permission drip by drip, day by day, so that over time people seek to come to me and then how do I grow? I grow because they tell the others. So here's, here's a case study. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago, I was cooked, kicked out of the book industry. My book, uh, which I had uh, had big hopes for, had failed, and they didn't want to publish my next book. And uh, I wrote a book called Purple Cow. And my challenge was, how do I get a self-published book to spread? Because I'm just one person. So this is the steps that I took. The first step was I earned over the course of months a column in Fast Company Magazine. That's hard, I get that. But I had a loyal set of readers. Perhaps 100,000 people were reading my work every month. That's because over time, drip by drip, they decided it was worth listening to. Then I made the book, but I put the book in a milk carton, which is not easy to do. And I wrote a column and I said, if you want a free copy of this, send me $5 for postage and handling and I'll mail it to you. And it turns out it make, only cost me $5 to make the whole thing, so I broke even. And I only made 5,000 of these. And so 5,000 people sent me $5. And then there was a, a second batch of 5,000 that they could order 12 at a time. That's all I did to promote the whole book. That's it. But what happened was the people who got the book put it on their desk. They didn't put the book on the desk. They put the milk carton on their desk. Why? Because they wanted other people to ask them about it. Not because they cared about me. No one cares about you. No one cares about me. It gave them status. It helped them lead. It got a change to happen if other people were talking about a purple cow. And so that 5,000 led to 10,000, led to 50,000, led to a million without me doing anything that seems like hype or promo because I made something other people wanted to talk about. And that is the thing that's available to people who aren't even authors, right? I'll give you another example. There's a, a company in um, California called Penguin Magic and they make magic tricks but they don't make them for professional magicians. They make them for amateur magicians. And the reason is because professional magicians only need 12 magic tricks and they don't buy new tricks. Amateurs, on the other hand, have two things in common. One is they need more tricks all the time because they only do them to their 10 friends and then they need another one. And two, they talk to other amateur magicians. So Penguin Magic sells millions of dollars worth of stuff every year without hyping themselves to the outside world. Instead, their mailing list enables them with permission to be able to say, we have a new one. And the people who want to go first rush to buy it. And then they tell their friends because it great raises their status to show that they have a new trick that their friends don't have. And then they rush to buy it and on and on. I have many examples. I could go on all day, but I don't want to take too much time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, let's talk about the future of marketing. Uh, do you feel that we need to push for permission marketing more or less uh, 
since you first coined the, the phrase? Oh, it's a heartbreak for me to get spammed every day, to get hustled by PR people, to watch brands that should know better resort to spamming because they think everyone else is doing it. Um, because it never works. It works for a little while and then they burn trust. My argument is that trust is what you need and attention might help you earn it, but you should never burn trust to get attention. You should burn attention to get trust. And so th the model here is, you know, when we built Yo-Yo Dime, was one of the first internet companies, we spent more than a million dollars to build a system that can do what MailChimp does for $7. So just because it's cheap to use an email service doesn't mean you should. And you have to be really smart about why you're emailing people or texting people or tweeting people or showing up in various forms of social media. Would they miss you if you are gone? And so I'm never going to persuade the spammers to stop spamming. I've tried. It's not working. What we can do is elevate the people who are accomplishing something. And we see it again and again, the brands that matter and the ones that are turning a profit are the ones that have figured out how to earn attention and go inbound. People like Patagonia, not people who have to hustle for every last sale. Asking for permission takes time. You talked about trust. Building trust takes time. Finding the niche audience that you're talking about in your MVA takes time. When do we go fast? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have time to do it right, when are you going to find time to do it over? And the thing that we do fast is learn. We fail fast. We learn fast. And most of all, we expose ourselves to emotional labor and do work that scares us fast. Because big companies that say they're in a hurry are really slow when it comes to doing something that scares them. But it's the thing that scares us that leads us to growth, not the hustle of stealing. And companies that say, I'm just doing my job, and the stock market forced me to do it, they're the ones that fade away. And instead, we have a chance to build something that matters. But the parts that involve other human beings need to be done at a deliberate speed. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about communities. I know that you're a big fan of communities and you mentioned in some of your interviews that you grew up as part of an actual community in Buffalo, New York. And today we use the word community in digital marketing all the time. Are those the same communities? Okay, so I wrote a book called Tribes and in the English language, that word has been misused to uh, offend and uh, demonize indigenous peoples. That's not what I mean. Tribes have been around for a really long time, tens of thousands of years since the dawn of civilization. We are organized to be in community into groups of probably 150, maybe up to 5,000, depending on Dunbar's number. People who we recognize, people where we feel safe, culture, People like us do things like this. What is it like around here? You can tell when you're in one part of uh, a city versus another because there's a culture there. And the mistake that so many marketers make is they think it's their tribe. You don't have a tribe. I don't have a tribe. What you do have is the chance to narrate and lead and connect a group of people who are going to be there even if you go away. And that idea that you are a guest, that you are a visitor, that the community, the tribe is hosting you and that your job is to make it better, more coherent, that changes the posture that the marketer brings to the table. And, you know, I would be remiss if I was in France and didn't talk about Colbert. So let's talk about him for a little while. Okay. Um, when, when the great European powers were busy becoming colonial powers, France was falling behind. That Spain and England were doing a better job, better in quotes, 
of colonizing countries where they could get raw materials. Colbert, who uh, worked for one of the kings, I can't remember which king, um, invented luxury goods. He invented the whole idea of Louis Vuitton. He invented the whole idea of artisans making something better than it needed to be that cost more than it should. And those items, you know, the Hermes saddle or whatever, went into the world and they weren't for everyone, but they were for communities of people where being seen as having a luxury good would increase your status and your affiliation so much that it was a bargain. And if we think about France's commercial heritage, it is not, we can make it cheaper than anybody else. It is not, you can pick anyone and we're anyone. You will not succeed with that because someone else is gonna win that search and someone else is gonna be cheaper on sort by price. What you will win at is there is a group of people who have decided, people like us do things like this, who have decided that in the culture, this is the thing. You need to find those groups, connect them, and elevate them. Okay, in, in a few minutes here at Inbound Marketing France, we will organize a battle with two teams. One team is uh, the growth hacking team, and uh, another is the social uh, selling team. Uh, many growth hackers prefer to succeed by really pushing the limits, saying publicly that they prefer to apologize uh, afterwards. <laughs> uh, from my point of view, this is the exact opposite of permission marketing. What do you think about it? So um, I know Andrew, the guy who coined the term growth hacking, and that's not what he meant. It is true that he worked at Uber for a while and that Uber had a lot of bad behavior but that's not what growth hacking is supposed to be. Growth hacking is building the network effect into the product itself. That what it means to be a growth hacker is to change the product so that it works better when other people talk about it. So it works better when more people use it. And there's a million examples of this, even from before the internet. There was a restaurant in New York City that was one of the fastest growing, highest grossing restaurants in the entire city. What was their secret? Three things. One, they used more garlic than any other restaurant, which meant that when you went to work the next day, people could tell where you went for dinner. Number two, they served more food than people could possibly eat. And number three, you couldn't get a reservation if you had fewer than six people. And what that meant was, if you wanted to go, you had to persuade five other people to go with you. And it was a party. And that is growth hacking because the restaurant grew not because their spaghetti was particularly good. They grew because they organized to grow. Thank you. Referring to the battle for social selling team versus the growth hacking team, who do you think would be the winner? <laughs> I want to be on the team that is doing work that matters for people who care. And if the growth hacking team is willing to define growth hacking as that, then that's who's going to win. Work that matters for people who care. And those are two clauses that belong in the same sentence, but they're not easy. Because first, people who care, who's enrolled in the journey, who wants what you're making as opposed to needing to be hassled about it. And second, can you make something they're willing to talk about? Great, thank you for that. Um, let's talk about privacy. Um, as consumers, the citizens have started to hate bad practices of marketers and found many, many ways to circumvent uh, and fight against these bad marketing practices. We do not respect them. And to make matters worse, uh, the legislator uh, a set work with, in particular, the GDPR and the anti cookie regulations, consents, and so on and so forth. What do you think about all of this stuff? Well, I'm not sure I would say to make matters worse. Uh, first of all, no one cares about privacy. If they did, they wouldn't have a credit card. As soon as you have a credit card, the credit, the credit card company knows everything about you. What people care about a lot is being surprised. And selfish, short-term, narcissistic marketers have been surprising people since the dawn of the internet. 
right? Someone visits a, a site to buy a mini skirt and then for the next three weeks, every time they visit any site on the internet, there's ads for mini skirts embarrassing them at work, right? They didn't ask for that. That's a surprise. On the other hand, if I go to Amazon and they forget everything I've ever purchased, they forget that I'm a man, they forget what I like. I'm not surprised, I'm annoyed. I want them to know about me because that was the deal. So what marketers should be doing is lobbying parliament and governments for more regulations about surprise because it will keep the bad actors from ruining it for everybody else. You know, I got kicked out of the Direct Marketing Association uh, in 19, uh, I don't remember, a long time ago, 1996. And the reason I got kicked out is I went to Congress in the US and testified that spam should be regulated, that spam was bad. And the Direct Marketing Association said, we're direct marketers, we think it shouldn't be regulated at all. Well, they blew it, they wasted a moment because this medium, which could have become magical, is instead crowded with spammers. And the same thing's true now with privacy, that what we ought to be doing is speaking up and saying, we don't want anyone to be surprising our customers, to be snooping on them in ways that make them uncomfortable, to be hassling them and to be stealing their attention. Because if we can make that the rule, then the good folks will do better and the lazy, selfish people will have to find something else to do for a living. That gives me something to think about in terms of direct marketing. And I want to ask you, on top of the Apple tracking transparency that has just rolled out in iOS 14, um, Apple recently announced, I think it was last week, the end of the email pixel and the doom of the open rate. Is it as big a deal, do you think? Or is it something we shouldn't care about because open rates don't matter? Um. You know, when I was doing email marketing at Yoga Dime, we had an open rate of 77% and a response rate of 32%. And today, if you got something like that, you would have to check the logs because there must be some sort of error. Uh, there was something to be said for having insight about whether you are using up permission by mailing people too many times and discovering that you are because your open rate keeps going down. Of course, it's ended up being used as a weapon to surprise people once again. Like if you get a registered letter and you have to sign for it when it comes to your house, you're not surprised that the sender knows you got it because it's implicit. But if you're using superhuman to email people and you can tell that they got the note, you're surprised because you didn't know that that was built into email. So again, we've got the same problem of surprise. And Apple has not, had a particularly good track record in the last five years of doing things on behalf of its users. It does things on behalf of its shareholders. And I think what Apple is doing here is carving out a position against Google because Apple has failed to build any really particularly useful thing on the web. Uh, they have no social media presence. They have no website that people visit regularly. And so by locking down the ability of certain kinds of marketers to track and etc they're just forcing people to send apple more money and uh, google's doing the same thing uh, google doesn't like blogs because if you are subscribing to a blog you're not going to google to search for it every time google does not like it if people are doing uh, you know various affiliate deals because then amazon can get traffic without paying google so you know we just need to keep looking back to what's in it for them and Apple's going to keep doing what's in Apple's interests. Do I think we will miss the open rate? Yeah, but I also think that technology gets around most of these things because if technology plus capitalism can lead to profit in the short run, someone's going to figure out a way to do that. Okay. Uh, here at the Inbound Marketing France, we've got uh, many, many people, professionals uh, watching us today. Uh, I've got a question for you. Do you feel inbound marketing is the right tactic for permission marketing? And if not, how could it be? Yeah, I think that they're just uh, variations on the same theme. Uh, the inbound phrase, as far as I know, uh, started in Boston, and it was a way of uh, 
not calling it permission marketing. But the idea is you still want a group of people who want to hear from you and are coming to you when they need something, as opposed to you having to pay a toll to Google or to pay uh, an irritation to the user every single time you want to sell them something. And so the magic of inbound is, is it worth it? Are you making something that's worth it? And a lot of marketers, if they're telling you the truth, would have to say no. They're just hustlers. And my thesis is no one wants to be hustled. No one wakes up in the morning saying, I hope someone hustles me today to get me to do something I don't want to do. Okay. Uh, when I, I learned marketing uh, at school, uh, they used to have only four Ps, <laughs> the product, the price, the price, and the promotion. And uh, no, and you, you invent two Ps? <laughs> no, how many Ps on the marketing <laughs> again? Can you tell us that? And do you think that we need to maybe reset marketing from the time being? Or? Uh, we, definitely, we definitely need to reset marketing. Um, yeah, I did Purple Cow. The reason it's called Purple Cow is because it starts with a P. And Permission, which also starts with a P. Uh, I'm lucky that there weren't the four Qs because we were running out of words with Q in them, but P worked out <laughs> fine for me. Um, the, uh, the reset is pretty simple. If you look at the brands that have been built since the demise of television, since the end of the era when TV commercials is how you built a brand, they are built on the network effect. They are built on remarkability and they are built on community. Those three things, they're not built on promotion, mostly not built on price. Certainly not built on placement because retail is falling away and Google and Amazon will list everything. So what you're left with is, are people talking about you? Would they miss you if you were gone? Are you doing something that a community cares about? And for the marketers who are tuning in, it's really simple. If your boss is giving you average stuff for average people and then money to promote it, you need to go back to the team and say, no, not going to do that. I am not going to do any more promotion until you give me a product worth promoting. And everything that touches the market is marketing, just like everything that touches the accounts is accounting. And that means that product design, hiring, side effects, diversity, these are all the marketer's job. The customer service people work for you, the designers work for you, all of it, because you're touching the market. And if you want to be the end of the chain, well, then you can't complain that it's not working because the secret is make great stuff. That's the secret, making great stuff. Great. Uh, from your point of view and for those who want to create an awesome project, um, a moonshot, as we can say, <laughs> uh, once the entrepreneur has got the idea, will you advertise him to start with why, like Simon Sinek uh, say, start with why, or to start with who, to start with people? What do you think? Start with why or start with who? Simon is a dear friend. We had dinner last week, and uh, this is something that he and I don't always agree on. I think that most organizations that have been through the why thing ended up with some tortured uh, backwards explanation. Their why is they want to make money. That's their why. You know, they have a they don't have a plumbing supply company because their why is they want to help people live better through hydration. They have a plumbing supply company because that's how they make a profit. And so given that that's the case, how are you going to grow? Because we've already decided you want to grow because you want to make a profit. You're going to grow because you're going to start with other people's why. What do they wake up worried about? What is their problem? Why do they want to be seen? What do they need? And what people want is dignity. They want to be connected. They want status and affiliation. They want freedom from fear. They want their problems to be solved. And yes, they like tension. They have FOMO, all of those things. Start with their why, and then your why will probably get taken care of. Now, I had a question that I had planned, but listening to you, I feel like I already have my answer because I wanted to ask you, <laughs> about the soft skills, because you recently mentioned in an interview that soft skills are crucial to develop for the future. So I'm guessing empathy is one of those soft skills. 
That's right. So let's, uh, and again, I have no idea how to translate any of this to French. Most big companies organize around hard skills. What is easy to measure? How many words per minute can you type? Do you know how to program in Perl or Ruby on Rails? These are hard skills in that we can test you on them. But when we do the uh, simple analysis of tell me about your best coworkers, tell me about the people who make the biggest difference in your organization, almost always we hear about people who are insightful and honest and loyal and creative and passionate and charismatic and connected and on and on and on. These are soft skills, but they're skills. And that's incredible because they're not talents. We're not born with them. All of us are born naked and afraid and unable to speak. No, these are things we decided to learn. And if you wanted to be a little bit more honest or empathic, you probably could be. Well, if you could be a little bit more, now it's a skill. And just like learning to juggle, you can learn to get better at it. And so we need to be smarter about hiring for these skills and in developing these skills. And the one that I will riff on for just a minute is empathy, because the deal is no one knows what I know and no one knows what you know. They don't believe what you believe. They don't want what you want. And if you can't then follow it with, and that's okay, then you have no chance to connect to them. Because if you are insisting that they are wrong, if you are insisting that they are ignorant, they're not going to listen to you. We have to go to where they are to say, I see you, I hear you. And based on who you are and based on what you see, you might want to consider thinking about this. That's practical empathy. That's acknowledging who's it for and what's it for and being really clear about the change we seek to make. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm, ran I'm ranting today, no, but, no, it's a, not at all, it's but day, um, it's a good day to be in France. I'm just warning the audience that they need to warm up because this is our last question from here. <laughs> and then the next question will come from you guys. So please be ready. Um, our last question from, from us, Seth. For everybody who's watching us from this room and in digital, what would be your advice to succeed in marketing in the next few years? I think if I was starting from scratch, I would say, what's the smallest viable audience? Where are a hundred people who, if they felt seen by me, would be eager to see me again? And then how would I give those hundred people something that their lives would get better if they told other people? And then I would show up and I would show up and I would show up. And 10 years later, I would be an overnight success because that process doesn't take money. It takes humility and empathy and care. And that's the one that's been working over and over again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now it's time for the question for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Seth, let me introduce you. First question from Valerie over there. Valerie is a big fan. Uh, maybe you can yeah, take the mic to Valerie. Yes, over there. Yes. I Valerie think is Valerie a big fan of you, Valerie. You have to take the mic <laughs> and to ask the, the first question to Seth. Come on. Hi, Seth. Uh, I'm so proud to ask you a question. Um, I'm a community manager in LinkedIn. Uh, et je ne vais pas continuer à parler anglais comme ça, parce que je ne parle pas couramment. I'll translate. <laughs> we'll translate that. Uh, en France, uh, la communication sur LinkedIn a quasiment explosé en 2019. Euh, en 2020, pardon, il y a eu plus de 60% de, de postes publiés par rapport à l'année euh, N-1 et plus de 30% de conversations sur LinkedIn, ce qui est énorme. Il y a 62 millions de Français d'employés. I'm just asking. Juste que je traduise au fur et à mesure, Pardon. parce que sinon je ne vais pas m'en sentir. Des questions so, courtes, des questions I'm, courtes I'm, aussi. I'm just translating the first half, but so far there's no question in it, Seth. So it's just the, the, the numbers. So Valérie was saying about how on LinkedIn, the communication has exploded in France. And between 2019 and 2020, there's been 60% more conversation and 32% more 
uh, 60% six, more publication posts. 60% more yeah. posts. And 32% more conversations. Conversation. Conversation. Sorry. Go ahead. Ta question. Donc, on constate que euh, il n'y a pas que les leaders euh, en entreprise qui communiquent, mais aussi les employés. En France, la notion de management dans les grandes entreprises sont plutôt hiérarchiques, avec une communication descendante. Les réseaux sociaux, et notamment LinkedIn, permettent d'avoir un profil LinkedIn égal une voix, d'être au même niveau qu'un leader en tant qu'employé. Est-ce que vous pensez que dans nos entreprises, nous en France aujourd'hui, cela va changer notre mode de management en un management plus participatif et collaboratif qu'il ne l'est aujourd'hui grâce notamment à LinkedIn. OK. So, in France we have a very hierarchical <laughs> a one. This is management. A one. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yes. on LinkedIn every individual is a voice and everybody's equal between leaders and employees and it doesn't matter whether you're very high up or very low on the hierarchy you can be the same person or you can have the same reach on LinkedIn. So the question is, yeah. do you think that LinkedIn will help management change and become more inclusive and collaborative and flatter, I'm guessing, in English? Right. Okay. So first, a, a small translation question. In English, manager and leader do not mean the same thing. I do not think it's possible to be a good community manager. I think it is essentially be a community leader. And managers are people who use power and authority to tell other people what to do. So a restaurant needs a manager to get the staff to come up on their shift on time, because otherwise no one will be there. A leader, on the other hand, is doing something voluntary. A leader is showing up, engaging with people and helping turn on lights and, and get them. So I'm guessing you're a community leader, and I think that's thrilling. Now. One of the challenges of our world is that industrial capitalism built the world we live in. It had a 150 year run. Industrial capitalism is about churning out the system with compliance and authority to make things better and cheaper every day. And that's why we have cars and we have clothes and we have air conditioning and we have buildings. All of that stuff was built by a command and control system that was built on caste and injustice. At the same time, it enriched a lot of people. But now, when we have machines and computers that can do a lot of the things that humans used to do, and now that we have all this information, which means that we can find somebody cheaper, which means that we can find a different job, which means that people with soft skills have choices, companies are freaking out because they don't have the power that they used to. Companies are realizing that they can't just keep churning stuff out if they're going to engage with creative leadership. And I think that one of the symptoms of this is that people are feeling the power to speak up on LinkedIn. I think if LinkedIn was around 100 years ago or 50 years ago, people wouldn't use it even if they could have because they would have lost their job. But now the people who might be speaking up feel more confident because they know that if they have real skills and they're willing to lead, someone's going to hire them. And we are in the middle of a revolution, and it's going to be fascinating and messy and sometimes even painful. So thank you for your leadership. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we've got another question. Let me uh, present to introduce you to Sylvie Lashkar, who writes a book series Social Selling. Uh, Sylvie, une question pour ça? Yeah, thanks for the promotion. So uh, my first question will be, Seth, would you help me to promote the book in America? <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's my first question. Uh, the second one is, so I'm the speaker of the battle, um, so growth hacking uh, versus social selling, and PPC stole my question, but uh, <laughs> do you think um, automation is going to kill personalization? That's one question. And the other one is, do you think it's... Let me do one at a time, is that okay? okay. Yeah. First one, the first one, this here, go. Um, per, no one cares about personalization. People want things that are personal, and those are different. And so automation is already cheapening what it means to be personal 
because we can't tell the difference sometimes. If something's personalized, because they mail merged it or put our name into it and personal. And so I think that what automation is going to do, because it's so easy to personalize stuff now, is make it so that things that are actually personal are going to go back up in value and things that are personalized are just going to be standard or worthless. So sorry, what's your second question? I just can't Thank keep you. two in my brain. At the same time. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, we speak about growth hacking and all those tools we want to give to, especially salespeople. Um, do you think it's a mistake to try to transform salespeople into marketers? So, um, selling, and I have a long history, Zig Ziglar used to be my teacher, friend, and mentor. Selling is simply marketing face-to-face, one-on-one where the human being is putting their emotional commitment on display as a way of demonstrating to the prospect that they're serious, that they mean it. And more and more items are not sold, they're simply marketed because customers are saying, I don't need a human being to create this feeling of tension when I can just look online and discover what I want to see. And I think selling is really important when it's done as collaborative problem solving because it can deliver information in ways that the web still has trouble with. And I think that the demonstration of showing up matters. That you know, the, the, your gracious hosts here today could have just had me uh, record a video and played it. But me showing up in real time and engaging is a form of using human capital to show that there's seriousness involved. So with all of that said, I think that what most salespeople want is for the marketers to do a better job so that they can do their work of getting back to being collaborative as opposed to marketers handing them average stuff for average people and the salespeople somehow having to hustle to make a sale. Thank you. To, to go back to the, the opportunity opened by Sylvie to promote his book from social selling in the, in the US, uh, will it be very challenging for you <laughs> to do that? Well, uh, I think that the very nature of all the conversations we're having today is such that the idea that there's a gatekeeper who's going to change the marketing dynamic for something like a book is not true. Oprah has left the building. That if I go way out on a limb to promote a book, I might sell 2,000 copies. That's all, 2,000. Now, 2,000 is more than none, but 2,000 is not a million. So how do you get from 2,000 to a million? You do it by writing a book that other people talk about. Not to talk about on their blog, but talk about with their colleagues, that it becomes part of the conversation. And I'm not writing the book, you are. And so I've never been under the illusion that I can make a book a hit. All I know is that uh, you don't need me. Thank you. We also have men in the audience. So I'm going to hand over to Stefan, who has a question for you. Hi, Seth. You, you were telling us that uh, first you need to build the great stuff. And uh, do you think it's still worth uh, putting a huge bunch of money on the table to make this great stuff grow? Um, yes, I do. I think that we are living in a world where it is culturally acceptable to make a commotion around a product, a movie, a article of clothing, a new kind of car. We have ways to do that without stealing people's attention. And it's very interesting. If you look at surveys, most people say they don't like advertising and they don't like their representatives in government. But then when you push, what they actually say is, except for the ads they really like and except for the representative they elected, then they like those things. So what we have the opportunity to do is if we make a great product or service, to be beloved for promoting it, that people still talk about the 1984 commercial from Apple. Well, the reason they talk about it isn't because the commercial itself was stunning, it's because the product 
for the people who bought it, and not very many did, maybe 100,000 bought it right at the beginning, was transformative. If it had been a great commercial for a lousy product, people wouldn't have talked about it the way that they did. So yeah, I think the culture wants you to put money on the table for a great product, but it has to be a product that the consumer thinks is great, not one that your shareholders think is great. Thank you. We have another Stéphane with another question. Bonjour. Bon, je vais me contenter We only answer français. questions from people in English. Je suis Stéphane. absolument trop ému pour faire l'effort de parler en anglais. J'ai deux questions. On a beaucoup parlé de data et d'intelligence artificielle aujourd'hui. Est-ce que vous pensez que la data et, et l'IA sont en, en, antinomiques avec la permission marketing ou bien au contraire, est-ce que cette data et cette IA peut aider à la permission marketing Première question. Merci. Stéphane is too emotional speaking to you to actually speak English right now. Uh, he will have two, two questions, but I'm asking only the first one and then we'll go on to the second one afterwards. The first question, we talked about data and artificial intelligence today a lot. And do you feel that data and artificial intelligence are um, against or, or to orthogonal to permission marketing or can they go alongside? Uh, years ago, I worked with Arthur C. Clarke, and he famously said, uh, artificial intelligence is everything a computer can't do yet. So people would say, well, as soon as computers can play chess, that will be artificial intelligence. But now that they can, it doesn't count. So there's all of these things that computers have been doing for us for a really long time. And AI is going to just continue going down that road. So if you're an x-ray technician, a radiologist, most... Uh, X-ray radiologists cannot read an X-ray as well as a computer can now. So that means is if you want to be in that business, you're going to have to do something more than just looking at a negative. And the same thing's true for people in marketing. If all you're doing is a job that a computer can do, you better need, you better hurry and find a way to create more value than that. Um, but I don't think that data or AI has anything to do with permission marketing. Permission marketing is a very simple concept. Would they miss you if you didn't contact them next week? That's it. It's not up to me. It's up to them. So I would like to think if I stopped blogging, some people would miss it. But I am certain that if I stopped getting that email from that insurance company, I wouldn't miss it. Maybe I've already stopped getting it. I have no idea. It's in my spam folder. So if you can use data to distinguish between those two groups, Fantastic. I think everyone would be in favor of that. Second question. OK, deuxième question, un peu plus personnelle. Sur quoi travaillez-vous actuellement et quelle est la prochaine tendance que vous allez nous offrir? The second one is a more personal question. What are you working on right now and what is the next trend you're going to talk to us about? Um, I live right next to a fjord called the Hudson River. And I've been lucky enough that most mornings at six o'clock in the morning, I'm able to paddle the canoe I built five miles up and down the river. And it's been a really useful chance for me to clear my head after the trauma that so many of us have experienced. Um, and so I'm deliberately not writing a new book. Um, who knows if that will change? But what I am paying attention to is the ramifications of what's happening as we give more and more people a voice, the long overdue focus on racial injustice, the idea that people don't want to work for a giant conglomerate doing what they're told all day in the office. That is a signal change, one of the biggest changes of our lifetime. And I think that we are seeing the end of the factory, the end of the white collar office, And something else is going to take its place. And I'm not sure what it is. And it's interesting to, to simmer on that. And then the other half of it is we're going to be talking about nothing but carbon for the next 20 years. And I don't think anyone's come up with a thoughtful, useful, actionable way that we're going to work our way out of this problem. And we need to. And um, I'm distraught about both of these issues. And I'm hoping that I'll come up with something worth saying. But right now, um, I don't think we need a better way to sell more chewing gum. We figured that part out already. 
Okay, thank you. We get uh, another question from Nathalie over there. Nathalie. Bonjour. Je vais poser ma question euh, en français. Euh, merci beaucoup pour cette vision très complète, très centrée sur le client et à la fois euh, totalement euh, vue vu d'hélicoptère qui embrasse l'ensemble des, euh, des, des thématiques du marketing. Moi, j'ai une question. Quand on n'a pas, comme vous, euh, la Big ID, la capacité à personnaliser euh, les parcours, euh, la capacité à personnaliser le message, il faut combien de marketeurs pour faire une bonne campagne Okay, I'm going to try and not forget anything that Natalie has just said. So she thanked you first for uh, being so customer centric and taking also the helicopter view of everything. And I've shortened it a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, and Natalie has a question about when we don't have all of your skills and all your ability to do both the helicopter view and deep diving into each and every single aspect of marketing as you've described it, how big a team do we need? That's a great, uh, thoughtful way to preamble your question. So thank you. Um, but I don't have anything special. I'm just more willing than most people to put an idea into the world and see if it bounces around or not. And I don't have deep knowledge of things like SEO or algorithmic ad placement or all of those tactics that have consumed so much of the time that marketers have spent. So yeah, you probably need to outsource a lot of work or hire people to do a lot of the logistics that need to get done. There's heavy lifting involved. But what I am trying to help people understand is that the core strategic questions are really pretty simple. They're simple to describe. They're just hard to answer. And so what I wrote about in the book, This is Marketing, are those you know, six or eight key principles. They're not strange. They're not like understanding how the human brain works. They're simply hard questions to ask about the choices we're going to make. And I don't think you need a team to do that. I think you need one person who's willing to show up and say, who's it for? What's it for? What will happen to their status? Are they seeking affiliation? What are they afraid of? Are we talking to people who value their attention and are we using it wisely? There aren't that many more questions to ask, but we're forgetting to ask them. Great, we got a question, Hélène. Yes, hello, uh, I'm Hélène. I'm a marketer, but more important, I'm also a mother of uh, two young boys. And looking at how they are communicating, consuming information online, uh, I am a bit worried about the job of yeah. marketers uh, in the future. So what's your view on that? Well, first, those kids are so lucky to have you. And thank you for your question. My, <laughs> you. my wife's, my wife's name that. is Alain as well. Um, yeah, I wrote a, a whole book. It's free. You can get online at stopstealingdreams.com. And it's all about how we are manipulated into thinking a certain way about education in a way that probably doesn't work going forward. And marketers are guilty of emphasizing this, pushing people. Uh, you know, in the, in the book, Santaram, there's a, a great, Shantaram, there's a great line, which is uh, happiness was invented by marketers so that they could sell more stuff. And there's a difference between satisfaction, peace of mind, belonging, and this modern thing we call happiness, which we get when we buy something. And your two-year-olds are already demonstrating to you that if their friends have something and they don't have it, their life would be better if they had it too. What can we buy? How do we use money and stuff to deal with our emotional dislocation as humans? And then we send them to school and school emphasizes that they need to fit in and they need to worry about, will this be on the test? And they need to do the minimum amount of work to get by. And they have to show up because it's the rule. And all of that was invented by corporations looking for workers in the long run. And part of our job as parents is to help our kids understand things like dignity and connection and resilience and being weird and leading. And you can do that for them because the system's not going to do it for them. 
Good morning, then. Tout va bien. <laughs> Super. Great. We get another question from Stéphane over there. Oui. Est-ce que nous devrions tous apprendre l'art du marketing pour rendre le monde meilleur? Should we all learn the art of marketing to make the world a better place? Oh, thank you for teeing that one up. That's exactly my point. You know, that I think marketing is the most powerful thing in most organizations. Marketing got us the world we live in today. Marketing is everything around us, our hopes, our dreams, our fears made real. And we should not seed this to some system that has no face. We need to take responsibility for it, to be able to say, I made this, I started this, I influenced that, because we have these incredibly powerful psychoactive tools and we're wasting them, trying to get a little bit more shelf space at the local supermarché. We can do something better than that as marketers. And I'm thrilled that you are each doing that kind of work. So thank you. Okay, we get another question. Yes. Hello, Mr. Godin. My name is Marco. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going uh, on French too because my uh, Spanish is better Terrific. than English. We, we can try in Spanish. <laughs> if you Muy want. bien. <laughs> yeah? Muy bien. bien. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Godin. Uh, Ma question, justement, pour rebondir, alors je vais faire trois temps, pour rebondir d'abord sur le premier temps avec le, le livre, euh, l'ouverture à l'international que nous donne sa bibliothèque. Cours pour la traduction. Hein. Ouais. <rire> Merci. Euh, en fait, effectivement, euh, ma, ma, ma question, c'est est-ce euh, que vous pensez que toutes les cultures euh, sont prêtes à la transition entre le marketing traditionnel et le marketing permissif Do you feel that all cultures are actually mature enough to go from traditional marketing to permission marketing? I feel like uh, all marketing was permission marketing 200 years ago. And it doesn't matter which part of the world you were in, whether it was industrialized or not. That the whole nature of how we brought things to others in the village was based on permission that there weren't a lot of door-to-door -door salesmen and spammers in 1492. And so uh, if I look at, you know, where is the most adoption of digital cash and cell phones, for example, it's in Kenya. And uh, we are going to be left behind in the West because other cultures are showing up and saying, you know what, we're not in any hurry to spam the world just so that our shareholders can make an extra penny. We understand that being part of a community is the long-term resilient way to A, make a profit and B, make a difference. And you know, Michael Schrag taught me, what do marketers do? We make a change happen. If you're not making a change happen, then why did you show up at work today? You're changing something. And if you are changing something, then the question is, are you proud of the change you are making? And we have enough leverage and enough insight to have influence at the organization and say, this is the change we're going to make. We're going to change this market or this person or this community in this way. That's how we will be measured. And that's what the great brands have always done. And it's what they're going to do again. Okay, here we got a bunch of questions over there. Michel. Uh, je vais la poser en français. Euh, donc, le contenu euh, a été porté par l'inbound marketing et aujourd'hui, on arrive aussi à une, une forme de saturation. On parle même un peu d'infobésité. Et donc, quelles sont les clés pour réussir aujourd'hui à continuer à, à pousser le contenu et, et, et à travailler sur, surtout sur cet axe-là dans le marketing Content is actually key to inbound marketing, but maybe we've reached a point of saturation in terms of content. We call that infobésité in French for the contraction, I don't know whether that exists in English. So how do we keep making content work for marketing? Okay, so there's content marketing with a capital C and there's content marketing with a small c. Content marketing with a capital C is, how do I hustle for people's attention by writing link bait articles that get their click so that then I can sell them something? That's over. It was uh, it had a short run, but people aren't, it's not working. Content marketing with a small C 
is the only kind of marketing. Content marketing with a small c is saying to somebody, I might be able to hustle this much of your attention, but I can't earn your trust unless I get that much of your attention. And to get from here to here, I need to offer you something that plugs into your cultural understanding of the world. That's content. That content might take the form of a TikTok video, but more likely it takes the form of a hard to articulate journey that the customer is on toward status and affiliation, right? So, you know, earlier I mentioned uh, the Birkin bag. Now a Birkin bag costs 14,000 US dollars. Where's the actual utility in it when you can buy a nylon sack for $6? So what's the extra $13,900 for? It's for content. The content is, how does it make you feel? The content is, who is Birkin? The content is, how many of these bags were made last year? The content is, what will my friends think when they see one? All of that is content. And so it's just not going to look like a Medium post, but it's still content. I don't know where you find your Birkin bags, but the last time I checked, they were 25,000 euros. <laughs> So let me, I let me know if you, if you find some, some at that price, I'll take it. Um, Bruno? I have, I have not checked. I, I'm not sure my wife wants me to buy her a Birkin bag. I, I'll need to find out. Bruno, une question. Hi, Cess. Uh, alors, en français, moi, je vous ai découvert uh, et connu uh, avec uh, le livre Permission Marketing. Si aujourd'hui, vous deviez l'écrire ou le réécrire, ça donnerait quoi par rapport à l'original I've discovered you with permission marketing. Um, if you had to write or rewrite it today, what would you change from the original edition? Um, so I've intentionally not rewritten any of my books because if I did, I'd rewrite them every month or two, but I would rewrite the whole book, um, except for the core precept. The core precept, which is two chapters of the book, is that attention is precious. We're not making any more attention. Stealing attention from people is foolish. Earning attention from people is the foundation for a business. But then I went, because I was so early before most of the World Wide Web, before social media, before Shopify, before the explosion of Amazon, all of these things, I was just hypothesizing a bunch of ways we could earn people's attention. And so most of the tactics would be replaced in the examples that I would give. But the core idea of the book, I don't need to rewrite that. And so what I guess I would say to people is, if you read the first four chapters of that book, you can write the next eight chapters. You don't need my help because you know what the next eight chapters say. Thank you. Vincent, a question. I said... Uh, my question was a bit the same that Bruno, but I will ask you whatever. But just before, I would like to tell you that I'm very proud to speak to you because we have a common point and a very big difference. The common point is that we both wrote books, but the difference is that you have 20 bestsellers while I have only 20 best buyers. <laughs> a nice lesson of marketing, so thank you. Um, The question is more global than uh, the one of Bruno. If you had the capability or the opportunity to go backward, maybe in the 80s or the early 90s, just before this period of hyper growth of marketing, business, sales, and everything, would, would, would you like to change something in this world of business and marketing? Would you like to do exactly the same if you could change things? Yeah. So in 1972, that's a little earlier than you're allowing me to go back, but I'm going to go back. In 1972, an economist named Milton Friedman wrote two influential short popular articles in which he argued that the only purpose of a corporation is to maximize the profit of the shareholders. Now he made that up. There is no history. There's no law that says this, at least in the United States. And so CEOs eager to maximize their paychecks embraced this and basically used it as an excuse for the last 50 years 
to say it doesn't matter that we're hurting people. It doesn't matter that we're shortcutting. It doesn't matter that we're polluting. It doesn't matter that we're not proud of our work because we're doing the only thing we are allowed to do, which is doing our job to make the maximum amount of profit. And if I could go back in time, like in one of those science fiction movies, I figure out how to get Milton Friedman a job as a plumber instead, because that was toxic. It created this cycle that has gotten us an enormous amount of income inequality, a lot of lousy Me Too products, and a race to the bottom. It has created this ratchet where people who have leverage and authority are refusing to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Because the, people would like to think the market as this amorphous thing knows what it wants and it's smart. But if the market knows what it wants, what do we need marketers for? The marketer doesn't, the market doesn't know what it wants. The market has a hunch as to its emotional needs, but it's the marketer who says, look at this, this will make your life better. And if we do it enough times, because marketing is powerful, we might be able to change the culture. And my argument 25 years into this remains, please don't do work you're embarrassed by. Please imagine that the person you're marketing to is your mom because we are living on a planet that gets smaller all the time. And the people in this room know more than anybody in your organization. You have the authority and the leverage to say no, to amplify things, to diminish other things. And that's on us. We're on the hook. And I think we have to own that. Wow. Wow. I'm sure that friends will welcome you with open arms after what you've said about Milton Friedman. Um, so we'll give the last question to Isabel. Hi, Seth. Um, I'm really, really proud to talk to you and uh, I will flow in French and I'm sure Laura will help me to translate. Um, Est-ce que, selon Seth, aujourd'hui, uh, l'account-based marketing est aussi une jolie façon d'obtenir la permission, mais des grands comptes Strategic. Isabel asks you if, um, in, according to you, is account-based marketing the right way to get permission from strategic accounts? Thank you for this question, Isabel. I need some help understanding um, what, do you, what do you mean by account-based marketing? Isabel. <laughs> sentence by sentence for the translation, Isabel? Yeah. Um, la based marketing, c'est une approche qui permet de rentrer en relation avec un compte stratégique. Account based marketing is an approach that allows to get in touch with a strategic account. En offrant une expérience de contenu personnalisé, mais auprès d'interlocuteurs qui ne sont pas venus vers vous. On va vers eux en étant proactif. So we have, um, we will deliver personalized content to a strategic account, but to individuals who have not been approaching you before. So you will f seek them out. But the Most strategic account has been identified. Right. Hold on. <laughs> no waste of time working tomorrow. I'm just, I'm reading, I'm reading something else. One second. Okay, so let, I want to talk for a little bit about business to business marketing because we haven't, that hasn't really come up. And business to business marketing is different in one huge respect. When we are selling to a business, they're not spending their own money, they're spending the boss's money. And so all of the drama we have as consumers around money goes away and it's replaced by new drama. And the new drama is what will I tell my boss? And if you go to an account trying to sell them something and you don't give them a good answer to what will I tell my boss, then the default answer is I bought the cheap one. And that's why RFPs exist. That's why companies are so hard to penetrate because they're used to people hassling them all the time. Pick us, pick us, pick us. We're the same as everybody else. And they're not giving their boss the story that they need. So my limited understanding of uh, account-based marketing, thank you for putting that idea in my head, is if you're busy selling to businesses and you're selling to all businesses, you can't do the hard work of understanding which businesses 
want the story, you can bring that person to tell their boss. And so this goes back to my idea of the smallest viable audience, which is to say, they're not all the same. There's a group of, let's say I'm trying to market McKinsey Consulting. McKinsey Consulting costs five times more than consulting sold by someone who used to work at McKinsey, that the brand increases its cost by a factor of five, even though you're getting the same report. Who wants to buy that? Well, what kind of senior executive needs to be able to go to their board or go to their boss and say, we're going to close this plant because McKinsey told me to. And you should do nothing to market that to someone who doesn't want to tell that story. And so again, this is a great way to, to end this conversation because it's what we've been coming back to again and again. Who's it for and what's it for? Have the discipline to say, it's not for you. Please call my competitor. They do what you want better than me. This is very focused around this story that you will bring to this boss to make a difference happen. And too often, the organization has spent so much time and money building a thing, now they say everyone should buy it. And part of the, uh, the argument I'm making to marketers is you should never say everyone. Everyone is not the future. Someone is the future. And we shouldn't look for prospects. We should look for students. Who wants to learn what we have to offer? Who's eager to cause a change to happen. Those are our customers. Everybody else is invisible. Thank you so much. That, uh, uh, yeah, hold on a second, hold on a second. Uh, thank you so much for this fire chat. Fantastic. Uh, we got a, a present for you because we, you know, uh, in France, that's a country of food. And uh, in order to close this fire chat, we'd like to make what we call a roti in France. It's return on time invested. So we'll ask all the people there to give you a note from one to five. Five is great, fantastic. It's a, it was awesome. And one is, a, oh no, I lost my time. Can we get on a, la régie? Est-ce qu'on pourra avoir une caméra sur les personnes qui sont présentes? We are going to start the roti. <laughs> and prêt? while the cameras are turning around, roti means brisket, which yes. is what <laughs> is related to food, Seth, because yeah. roti means brisket. <laughs> so return on time vested. One, two, three, c'est parti. Allez, on y va. All right, five, 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 great. So that, what do you think about this fire chat? So different than a keynote, no? <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Uh I thought the, this group, this room, and the two of you, off the charts. One of the best gigs I've been invited to in a year, and I would do it every day if I could. So thank you for then the time. Then I hope you'll be effort. back next year in person at Inbound Marketing France. Thank Seth you. Godin, everybody, thank you very Merci much. Merci, Laura. Merci, Laura. Au revoir. Merci, bye-bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. Yay! Bye -bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Salut à tous. Ciao. Merci.